My name is Gina Chang. I'm a conservator from the National Museum of Norway. I'm responsible for the conservation of contemporary art. The official title of my job is the conservator of new art forms, which literally means that I take care of the artworks that cannot be categorized in the traditional old art forms, such as paintings, sculptures, textiles, etc. So I do mostly work with the time-based media artworks and then uh, installations. This is my third time attending at uh, No Time to Wait and the first time presenting. So I'd like to uh, first thank all of you, uh, the organizers and participants for building the events and community to be worthwhile to be part of it. My presentation today deals with one of the causes of why we are here yesterday, today, or year before. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they are. <laughs> <laughs> more. Uh, many of you, if not all of you, have concerns on or struggle daily with obsolete technologies and objects, assessing the risk, devising innovative strategies and tools to be dealt with the digital objects, software, hardware that are soon to be obsolete, if not already obsolete. The anxiety is here and out there. We don't have time to wait. Um, by the way, yesterday I learned a new word, imposter syndrome, which I found that the word not only explained my existential anxiety in recent years as a time-based media conservator, but also fits perfectly as an introduction to the general direction of my presentation. In other words, I'd like to talk about the conservative anxiety of obsolescence a sort of uh, PowerPoint version of the goalie's anxiety at the penalty kick by the vendors. To do so, I want to generalize understanding and problematization of obsolescence through and beyond the field of museum and archive conservation. Because just like the comments made by a gentleman in the audience yesterday, it has bothered me whether the way I have understood and uh, problematize the obsolescence is too narrow or exaggerated or framed and delimited by my own profession. At the same time, I believe and hope as a conservator, who is also a citizen, a human being, that what I do and care professionally are aligned with and have relevance in outside the walls of museums. So please allow me for my articulation of the obsolescence in a broken world way in broken English. The presentation takes a cue from Stephen J. Jackson's essay, Rethinking Repair, published in 2014, that advocates the possibility of a new epistemology of new media and information technology based on broken word thinking. It is a thinking or exercise that focuses on breakdown, maintenance, and repair rather than growth, innovation, and novelty. Broken word thinking is to see the world as always in peril, as Jackson puts it, a fractal world, a centrifugal world, an always almost falling apart world. Just like the Victorian episteme influenced heavily by the second law of thermodynamics concerning the irreversibility of natural process. This appears to be pessimistic, but what's crucial about the broken world thinking is that the world is also a world in constant process of fixing and reinvention reconfiguring and reassembling into new combinations and new possibilities, a topic of both hope and concern. Jackson calls our attention to the world disclosing properties of breakdown. That is to say, at such breaking moments that we learn to see and engage our technologies in new and surprising ways. For example, instability of systems or infrastructure is largely unknown or invisible until breakdown. Second, the broken world thinking foregrounds and hails repair, maintenance, and care as an aspect of technological work that brings about moral relation to the world of technology, redirecting our focus from production and innovation to sust sustainability. So far has been a brief and thin run down of Jackson's thesis, but I think it's enough for you to catch where I'm coming from, at least, although it's not enough to know where I'm going with this. 
Okay, going back to the conservator's anxiety of obsolescence, you are now looking at the new National Museum of Norway, which will open in 2021. Since 2016, the construction of the new building has been going on, and we are all very proud of the new museum building. However, the public opinions about the building have not been so kind. They criticize the building's closed architecture with very few windows, as it reminds them of a prison or a mausoleum. On the other hand, I was thinking, wait a minute, isn't it also true that museums are sort of mausoleum or memorials for the object? The very thing or on thing that is coming into museum will be obsolete one day in the world out there. Sooner or later, only matters. It's our job to prepare things to become obsolete. Don't wait, no time to wait. Maybe go even further, go ahead in time and wait for it. The museum will house about 400,000 objects in our collections, ranging from medieval panel paintings to queen's dresses to architectural models, to teaspoons to underwater drones and to performance artwork. So a few days ago, I came across an exhibition technician making mounting supports for these beautiful objects. Both of us didn't have any clue what they were first. I thought they were belt buckles, and she thought they were keyholes. Has anyone had this idea? They're called tsuba and came from Japan. A tsuba is the hand guard of Japanese word. It serves several purposes. <coughs> is for balancing the sword, protecting the hand of sword holder from attack and kind of status symbol for a sword owner. Thus, the Japanese sword suba became an elaborate piece of art far beyond its practical use. They lasted quite a long period from 14th century to the 19th century when people stopped sword fighting. And as you can gather from all different names describing the parts of the sword, the Japanese sword technology and art was and is highly specialized in terms of their makers and consumers. The encounter with the suba brings about the first aspect of obsolescence. Unlike a general assumption about obsolete technology or things, they haven't completely vanished. They linger and persist physically, but become somehow unknowable, invisible, or quaint to the larger part of population. If you twist this thought around, things obsolete, uh, obsolesce, because of not paying attention to or losing interest because some changes occur in our life cycle or priorities, etc. The obsolescence is thus political, social, economical, cultural, temporal, and local as much as technological. Then is obsolescent concept for every conservator, not just conservator of time-based media? Obviously not. Take this strange object made by a young Norwegian jewelry artist, Emil Gustafsson, for example. The object is an interactive brooch that measures the distance between its wearer and the others who she will have a contact with. It runs a single program patch that turns the signal from the proximity sensor to three different colors, like green, yellow, and red. Since it was brooch made by jewelry artists, it entered into our design collections initially. But then, since it has electric tech stuff, so it was turned over to me. And then it all started to gotten out of my hands. If I were an object conservator, my documentation and conservation planning would have been pretty much straightforward. I would document its dimensions, materials, colors, and wrap it in an acid-free paper and put it in a box for storage. But no. Anything with the red-made technology, digital interactivity artist's intent turned the red lights on me. Obsolescence, malfunctions, ephemeral, since the artist only explained what it does, not only how, uh, not how it does what it does, in order to document the working, work defining properties, and to devise a preservation plan that best accommodates the artist's intention, and to prepare for the days that the mini Arduino and the sensor becomes obsolete or broken, I felt nothing but to cast as many as safety nets possible or, uh, ordering uh, possible. So I, I ordered some same parts, noting the wiring and the range of proximity sensors and finding a similar program patch, etc. 
So it seems that even within a conservation field and within the same institution, there exists different expectation on the life cycle of the same object and how to conserve it. Within the context of conservation exhibition of jewelry item, the demise of social distance measure brooch <laughs> appear almost impossible as long as the matrix, a material matrix withstand the time. However, within the conservation of interactive contemporary art, there are so many things at stake. On the other hand, even if I did cast all the possible safety nets to think about until the work is show, uh, shown again, you don't know when, actually, it is forced to obsolescence by just being on the shelf. To store away something is to temporarily forget about it until we record it which happens very often, especially to the works by the minor artists. The intermittency between each time their works are shown are just about too long for the information about the work and the components that can be gathered, documentation, uh, or uh, test knowledges of the conservators to be relevant anymore. To discuss the life, death, or becoming obsolete of an artwork with the artist is not an easy task, especially when we together try to document the range and intensity of artist's intention covers on our work defining or significant properties. When it comes to the work that has digital contents, the possible scenarios dealing with both the defining significant properties and preservation strategies seem to the eyes of conservators in different fields in breach of common sense, conservation conventions, or ethical guidelines. Nonetheless, the artists are generally very comprehensive about the situation and shares our concern and anticipation about the risk of obsolescence. We proactively reach out to artists upon her work entering into the museum, survey the existing digital contents and documentation, and advise on the preparation of documents and files for submission. And we explain why we do our digital preservation in open source format and standards. I'll interview them about their working methods, technical and conceptual details of work, asking views on uh, various what ifs. What if things break down, become obsolete, how the artists want us to proceed with the various preservation scenarios, or just to let destruction continue. And we diligently make generation trees as a relationship within the work or related works. All these measures are coming from single motivation, heavily influenced by the anticip anticip anticipation of the work will come apart in one way or the other. Thus often I feel the very strange but strongly strong kinship with a funeral helper. I transmit, transmit my professional interest, concerns and anxiety to my clients ensuring the artist's intention alive even after, after their death. I'm also afraid and cautious about the discussion about the preventive conservation measures, anticipating obsolescence with the, uh, it will uh, inevit inevitably influence the artwork and the artist alike, potentially restricting and censoring the future artistic choices or engendering a hybrid version of an original artwork. Then what is obsolete? What does it mean to be obsolete? Washington um, Post ran the obituary for VCR when the Japan-based uh, Funai Electronics ceased production of VCR at the end of July 2016. And it seems the tone was that VCR had been generally regarded as obsolete long before then. But according to the section 108C in US copyright law, a format is obsolete if the machine or device necessary to render perceptible work stored in that format is no longer manufactured or is no longer reasonably available in the commercial marketplace, which means VHS or VCR is not obsolete. When you turn your attention to the other parts of the world, we also see different pictures of obsolescence. Take, for example, Nollywood. The Nollywood film industry was born in the early 1990s during a severe economic downturn in Nigeria. Kenneth Nebu had an excess uh, number of imported VHS video cassettes, so he decided to use them to shoot Nigeria's first straight-to-video movie, Living in Bondage. 
By 2007, an estimated 9,000 feature-length film had been made, and it was estimated that 45 films were being released every week. In 2013, Nollywood ranked as the third most valuable film industry in the world. While the people in the Northern Hemisphere generally regard VHS as a passé, obsolete, it had its revival in the South, demonstrating grassroots resilience and optimistic entrepreneurship. Seeing Nollywood the phenomenon together with the Ghana's e-way salvaging industry recalls Jackson's moral technology in broken world thinking. We now realize that being obsolete is different than decay. It is designed and thus forced, having no relation to the object's function and utility. But value, that's changed. The obsolescence is planned and calculated within commodity culture in the developed parts of the world. The decline is value. Uh, the declines in value forces to scarce, disappear, and invisible only to show me the way to the countries in which their resources are scarce. <laughs> then can we also say that preservation and maintenance, which attempts to prolong the life of things that have already been sentenced to death, are activities with or without intention of resistance to the destructive force of capital interest in technology. Another unexpected outcome of the one uh, media becoming obsolete is the rendering its properties and shortcomings as some of, uh, sort of esoteric novelties. In uh, 2017, crowdfunded stream movie Kung Fury is all about that. The movie shot entirely digital is not only full of reference to the 80s culture, but also has overtly VHS look. I mean the look of VHS that has been rented out for a thousand times in Blockbuster. This digital uh, simulates tracking glitches with nothing but fetish and the commodification of the TK malfunction and imperfection over you sign analog medium that has actually technological and historic grounds and has formed the cultural specific memories in the VHS generations. In the same token, rather serious outcome of one media become obsolete and the salvage attempt usually through migration to digital media and upgrade this total change in the significant property of work as well as artist's intention. This is the case of Norwegian artist Shell Bergen, 10 channel video installation shift to from 1995. Like Woody and Steiner Vashulka, Bergen artistically uh, invested heavily at time on the materiality of video signals and the reference to TV industries he often collaborated with Dave Jones, who supplied custom-built video scenes, and most installation works are based on live manipulation of video signal. The artists and work invest in media specific, uh, specificity is essence of media in modern sense, such as ontology of phot photography uh, images, video, films, etc. What happens to the essence and authenticity medium when they are forced to be lived digital live? So the year was 2012 when we pulled out Shift 2 again for the exhibition. To the horror of both conservator and exhibition technician, they found what we call a symphony of obsolete nightmare. Basically, there was nothing there that could work in the year 2012. So through hardware, media, and expertise. In the end, they found this gentleman through a closed mailing list who used to work at the American Embassy in the 80s as an IT guy. Uh, so why can't we just hack the time? Well, it seems that the problem degradation of instability of media persists in the future. In the Kittler's dictum of, of information theoretic materialism, um, loosely, uh, it can be uh, saying it can, if it cannot be processed, it doesn't exist. With the digital entities, if you can process, so it is, it is not there. In the scene at the Tyrell archives, there was a mention about uh, a blackout, which wiped out all the data on the surface of Earth. Ironically, all the old obsolete media and paper survived. 
I found this kind of sci-fi imagination of archive in the future very interesting. I'd like to use it as an analogy for the present day collective psyche toward the technology. When faced with a total new situation, McLuhan or famous says, we tend to always attach ourselves to the object, to the flavor of the most recent past. We look at the present through the rear view mirror. We march backwards into the future. Thus, the dystopia of year 2000, uh, 2049, built on the collective amnesia induced by the blackout, seemed to throw the, our own anticipating gaze towards the technological innovation back us. We are constantly reminded with the instability and eph ephemeral ephemeralness of digital technology that will always near perfect. This scene in particular when K passes the corridor of the obsolete replicants grotesquely archived. If we consider the replicants in Blade Runner are more human than human, the archives are nothing but the blatant self-portrait of our own future as obsolete beings. As much as we are impressed with the efficiency of the tools we are working with, we feel also threatened by the language and working of the tools that surpass our understanding. We are collectively marching towards a horizon where we bec become outsourced and outdated, or more accurately, the horizon is receding towards us in lightning speed. To wrap up my talk in a way relevant to the open source community, I want to join me at the riddles of Tower of Babel. I always wonder about whether the fall of the Tower of Babel was supposed to mean as a good or bad thing. The god was angry at the man's pride and destroyed the tower that has been built in cooperation and universal or uh, ideal language. The loss of perfect language and the ensuing misunderstanding among the men must mean pretty bad. On the other hand, the diversity of language in the hindsight doesn't mean, doesn't seem bad at all. As I learned, not only the open source tools that help us to resist obsolescence, obsolescence of things that we preserve, but also the languages that the engineers build the tools obsolescence. The reasons can be attributed to the many things, lack of funding, people lose interest in maintaining, repairing, and caring in the project. It goes also in the opposite way, as a token to the innovation of the tools and language to be better, more perfect, they seem to be settled with us sacrificing the old virgins. As Bruegel repeatedly raised and uh, destroyed the Tower of Babel, the Tower, our ideal community, and, and languages seem to go through the cycles of up and down. Thank you. Thank you.